السلام علیکم ان الحمدللہ نحمده ونستعینه ونستغفر ونعوذ باللہ من شرور انفسنا وسیعت اعمالنا من يد الله فلا مدل الله ومن يد فلا حادي الله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحابه أجمعين. First of all, I would like to thank you all, brothers and sisters, for giving me this opportunity to be a reminder to myself first. I would like to thank the organization for bringing me out here to Denmark. As the Prophet وسلم, said, if you don't thank the people, then you don't thank Allah. My talk today, inshallah ta'ala, will be about my journey to the religion of Islam. What made me leave a lifestyle that some of the youth, even here in this country, is running towards. If some of you guys heard my life story before, please be patient, as I'm sure there's many people in this room that never heard of me and never heard my life story. So I want to try to go through it briefly, inshallah ta'ala. Um, I was born to Muslim parents, alhamdulillah. Both of my parents converted to the religion of Islam before I was born. But at the age of three, I witnessed both of my parents get murdered in front of me. And from that day on, I moved to the house of my grandparents, who actually raised me as a Christian from three years old up into the age of 25 years old. I come from a neighborhood, man, where you saw many violence, drug dealing, murdering, fighting, whatever you name, I come from a hood and we was involved in this type of activities. But at a young age, I wanted to figure a way to get myself up out of that environment. Many of us in America, in the inner city, we try to figure ways to get up out of the hood quickly. As you see, some of us turn to basketball, some of us turn to education, myself and many like me turn to the music industry. But I didn't know and I didn't expect that once I come into the music industry, that the lifestyle that I was running away from was waiting for me on a larger scale. One of the ways I got into the music industry was through an individual by the name of Tupac Shakur, and I'm sure you guys heard of Tupac Shakur, sir. Well, Tupac, for those that didn't hear of him, as our brother Khalid, mashallah tabarakallah, <laughs> he didn't know who Tupac was. Tupac Shakur was an individual who became one of the most most selling rec record artists in the history of rap music to the point that even to this day he's in the Guinness Book of World Records for selling the most rap records. So I'm sure some of you guys heard of Pop, right? Who didn't hear Tupac? Show your hands. Because Brother Khalid can give you some education, inshallah. <laughs> but Tupac, when I first met Tupac, I remember telling myself that I have to impress this individual. So when I walked up into the hotel room, I remember telling him about how I come from a hood how I sold drugs, how I seen this and I done that. But I remember Tupac, he stopped me in the middle of this conversation and he said, I need to know that if I put you involved in the music industry, you're not gonna waste my time bringing that ignorance from the street with you into the music industry. So I knew right there that this individual by the name of Tupac, he was different. And he said also, if I put you involved in the music industry, I wanna make sure that you're gonna try to help others, et cetera, et cetera. So Tupac decided to put a rap group together and he wanted to call his rap group The Outlaws. And he said that I want to give you guys names of so-called enemies of the West or so-called tyrants. So one by one, Tupac would give us names such as Gaddafi after the former Libyan president, Muammar Gaddafi. Another member was Hussein after the former Iraqi president, Saddam Hussein. Another member was Idi Amin. Tupac changed his name to Machiavelli. And he gave me the name Napoleon after the French emperor Napoleon Bonaparte. And the reason why he gave me this name Napoleon, man, because back in the day I used to have a very bad temper. So Tupac said the reason why I have this temper is because of my height. He said I had the short man complex. He said they, being that I was short, I was mad at the world. So he said your name is Napoleon. The first record that I ever appeared on was a record called Me Against the World, and this record sold over three million records worldwide. And at this same time, Tupac happened to one day walk into a recording studio. And the reason why I'm walking you guys through the history of my, my outlaw days or through the music industry, because I want you to pay it very I want you to be attentive and pay attention to why I'm breaking it down so you can see why I walked away from that lifestyle. So I'm gonna walk through, I'm gonna walk you through major events 
major events that happened between myself and happened to Tupac Shakur and the rest of the members of the Outlaws. So at this particular time, Tupac happened to walk into a recording studio, got into an elevator, three gunmen followed him in the elevator. They pressed the emergency stop button, they pulled out three pistols, and they robbed Tupac for $40,000 worth of jewelry, and they shot him five times. Any of you guys familiar with this incident? Huh? Some of you, huh? Some of you guys were still in your nappies, your diapers. So I'm gonna really walk you guys through this. The people at this particular time that tried to murder Tupac, it was actually hit on his life. These were gangsters from New York City who decided to come in the studio this time. Not only did they wanted to rob Tupac, but they had an order from someone bigger than them to take the life of Tupac Shakur. So after this incident, Tupac got arrested and he spent one year in prison. There was an individual by the name of Suge Knight. You guys heard of Suge? Huh? What company he was from? Death Row Records. Suge Knight at this particular time, he was the CEO of a record company called Death Row Records. They were responsible for putting out rap artists by the name of Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, and now they signed Tupac Shakur. Not only did they sign Tupac Shakur because of a, a record deal or business transaction, but they also signed Tupac Shakur because Suge Knight, he was also enemies of the people that shot and, and, and robbed Tupac that day in New York City. So Suge Knight decided since me and Tupac have the same enemies, it's best if I sign this individual to my record company and we become brothers, etc., etc. So after Tupac signed a record deal to Death Row Records, he put a record out called All Eyes On Me. You guys heard of this record. This record sold over 20 million records worldwide. Myself and the rest of the Outlaws performed on maybe about five or six songs on this record. At this particular time, Tupac was the number one selling rap artist ever. I remember we were walking to a mall with this individual. They used to have to turn, turn down the mall or close down the mall because of the amount of people screaming and going crazy for Tupac Shakur. And prior to Tupac signing to Death Row Records, he had many songs speaking about death. And he used to always talk about how he don't want to live anymore. To the point that as many times he would sit in the living room with myself and the rest of the outlaws and he would speak about death, how he didn't want to live. But I remember having a conversation with Tupac and I believe that this conversation was the first conversation that sparked a plug in my brain to make me start thinking about life and death. One day we were sitting in the living room of Tupac, he just purchased him a mansion in Malibu, California. His backyard was literally the ocean. And we were sitting in the living room and we had a conversation with Tupac and he said to me and the rest of the outlaws, he said, remember how I used to always speak about death. Not only did he used to speak about death in his music, but he used to always speak about it on a normal conversation. And he used to always freely say how he don't want to live anymore. And Tupac said, but now that I have this money, I just purchased my house, he just purchased a Rolls Royce, he said, for some reason I don't want to die anymore. Unfortunately, a couple months later, Tupac was in Las Vegas, he got into a fight with an individual, a few hours later there was a drive-by shooting, they shot Tupac 13 times, he died six days later in the hospital. And I remember reflecting and telling myself, and I remember watching Tupac chase after death. And I remember asking myself, this is very strange, as soon as Tupac come to the conclusion of his life that he don't want to die anymore, that's when an angel of death snatches his soul. So for the first time in my life, I start to say and tell myself that, wait a minute, it seemed like we have no, no choice of when we're gonna drop dead. Even though at this particular time of my life, I had no religion. As I mentioned, I was born a Muslim, but I was raised a Christian. But one of the things I always kept in the back of my mind, and I always believed, that it had to be another life after death. I was an individual, alhamdulillah, I was upon the future of Islam that I didn't believe that an individual cannot come and tell me that we live our life and when we drop dead is over. Because the reason why I'm sharing this to you brothers and sisters because you have individuals to this day, 2012, that believe there is no, no life after death. And I used to question myself and I used to say, how come, for example, it would be a woman, she would carry a baby for nine months, she would give birth and maybe that baby would be born a still, death, still birth where the baby would come out dead or the baby will live one day, or this child might only live one week. You mean to tell me that there's no other life for this baby? What is the purpose for this baby to be born if there's no other life for this baby? What is the purpose of this baby, the, mom, the mother going nine months, the baby live for one day? You mean to tell me the baby go to the grave, halas, there's no more life? So I used to always contemplate about that there have to be another life after death. 
And when I used to think about Tupac in his grave, it made me more curious about what's happening to my friend while he's in the grave. But then again, I had no answers because I was living my life upon no religion. I was just believing. I had my own understanding. I was, going, I was believing according to my own desires. So I continued to live my life. I continued to do music. Me and the rest of the outlaws, we put a record out called Still I Rise. This record sold over two million records worldwide. And for the first time in my life, I started to make a lot of money. The first check that I received at the, at the age of 16, 17 years old was for about $150,000. Every six months, I was receiving another check, it's like, or more money, and I was making a lot of money on tour. And I remember I said, now that I make this money, I have to live the American dream. I need to go buy me a house, I need to buy me some bling bling, I need to buy me a car, I wanted to live the American dream. So I set out, I purchased my house, I purchased a brand new car, I remember I had purchased jewelry. I was living the American dream. I was the most happiest person on the face of the earth at this particular time. But as days went by, as months went by, I noticed I became depressed. And I used to sit back at night trying to ask myself, how come I'm not happy? And I used to make all types of excuses. The shaitan used to come to me and say, man, you're not happy because look at your house, it's only three bedrooms. Even though I'm in the house by myself. And I used to wake up and say, you know what? I need to buy a bigger home. And I went and I purchased a bigger home, gated community, all million dollar homes. And I said to myself, man, I'm living the American dream. I had to be happy. Halas, I got money in my bank account. I got a nice brand new car outside, jewelry, house, brand new house. From the outside looking in, I would seem like a happy individual, sir. As far as, far as materialistic things go, you would think an individual's happy. No? Huh? If you had a house, think about it. You're only 20, 21 years old, 18 years old, you got your own house. You got a brand new car outside, $80,000, $100,000 car outside. You got bling bling jewelry. You got everything. Why shouldn't I be happy, sir? But every single day, every night I went to sleep, I was depressed. Every night I went to sleep, I was the unhappiest person maybe on the face of the earth. And I started to ask myself, how come this is not bringing me happiness? So I got to the point of my life that I didn't even want to live anymore. I became suicidal. I said, man, there's no, uh, no purpose in me living on this earth if I cannot be happy. I probably experienced everything you can imagine. Drugs, money, party, did it all. And now that I don't have any happiness, I used to tell myself, there's only one thing I, sh I should do. One, only one thing left for me, and that's to die. Wallahi, man, I used to sit outside of my house thinking that today, I have to figure a way to get somebody to kill me. Wallahi. I used to drink alcohol every single day. I used to walk outside of my house and tell myself, there is no way that I'm going to walk outside of my house sober. Because I was in denial that I don't have any happiness. And with that same mentality, drinking, I used to make excuses. For example, I used to say, another reason why I'm not happy is because I don't know my mother's side of the family. My mother, for example, she was from Puerto Rico or Cuban. So I remember waking up one day and saying to myself, matter of fact, I'm going to Puerto Rico. I called my brothers, I called my cousins, I said, man, pack your bags, we going to Puerto Rico. Wallahi, man, the shaitan would come to an individual. He would, give them, he would give them excuses that does have no value on it. When the individual sit back and start contemplating why he's not happy, the shaitan will come and say, maybe you ain't smoke enough weed today. Maybe you ain't try this new alcohol that the rappers are talking about in their videos. Maybe you ain't get this type of clothes. So nowadays you see even Muslims, even Muslims, we only get our happiness from materialistic things. If we don't have the, 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 the closest shoes on that Jay-Z is wearing, we're not happy. We don't dress like Beyonce, we're not happy. Even Muslim, this is our happiness off of materialist, temporary happiness. So I told myself, man, the reason why I'm not happy is because I don't know my Puerto Rican roots. So I told my brothers and my cousins, pack your bags, we're going to Puerto Rico. I even went to a friend of mine, his name George, he spoke Spanish. I said, I'm gonna pay for your airline ticket. You're gonna come and you're gonna be my personal interpreter. You're gonna be my, you're gonna, you're gonna, tra you're gonna come, whatever I say in English, you're gonna tell the people in, Puerto in, in the language of Spanish. So I remember I went down to Puerto Rico, man, maybe two days, I had a little bit of fun. The third day, I'm back to my depression. And I used to ask myself, I would give anything, all the money in my bank account, only to feel happiness in my heart. Because I got to the point, man, that I was suffering in the inside. Wallahi, man, I was dying in the inside. The only thing that I wanted was peace in my life. And with this attitude of drinking every single day and smoking every single day, one day I get into a fight with my little brother, and it happened to be a Muslim in the parking lot this day.
And this Muslim individual who broke the fight up, we exchanged phone numbers, and he used to invite me to the masjid, he used to call me every day, come to the mosque. At this particular time in my life, I didn't trust Muslims, because the people that murdered my mother and father was from the nation of Islam. But just because this individual, this Muslim brother, he broke the fight up between me and my brother, I feel like it's my haq, uh, it's his haq to take his invitation and go to the mosque. So I remember I called the homies up. I said, look man, we going to this place called the mosque, the temple. I remember I packed a gun, a loaded gun, because as I said, I didn't trust these individuals. And I went, walked into the masjid, and I said, I'm just going to pay attention to these Muslims. And this is why it's very important for us Muslims living in the lands of the non-Muslims, that we should have the o'clock of a Muslim in everything we do. Because from the outside looking in, the non-Muslims are going to judge Islam according to our behavior. So when I walked into the masjid, I noticed when the brothers are walking, they hear salam alaikum. I would see this brother get up, pour a drink for this brother. Wallahi, I never seen nothing like this in my life. So I used to say, hold up, these are not feminine brothers. These are masculine brothers. And they pour a drink for another man. In my community, if you come from the hood and you pour a drink for another man, halas, you cannot come back outside the next day. So I wanted to know what these people was upon. Why is these people happy? Why is these people friendly? So I said, I'm sure the longer I stay in this masjid, they're going to break. This has to be fake. There's no way that there can be brotherhood according to what I'm seeing today in this masjid. So I remember prayer time came and a brother told me to get up, pray with him. And I said, you know, brother, I don't know how to make salat. I don't pray. He said, no, nah, just go ahead with the flow. Whatever you see me do, whatever see, you see the brothers do, you do. We put our hands like this, you put your hands like that. He said, but remember, and I remember his words clearly. He said, when you put your face to the floor, he said, now you have a chance to have a conversation between the one who created you, no one is in between, a conversation between you and your creator. So whatever you want, you shall ask your creator. And I remember putting my face down to the floor, and the only thing that I wanted in my life was happiness and inner peace. And I remember asking Allah, to please guide me to a way of life that's going to bring me tranquility and bring me inner peace. And after that prayer, I felt like a burden was off my back. This is the first time in my life ever I put my face down to the floor and prayed to the one who created me. Ever, ever. The only time I used to pray prior to this is when I wanted money. Or if I wanted something. My check is coming too late, oh now I know God. I wanted some money, if I wanted something from this dunya, then I would pray. As soon as I get it, a stack for the law, I will forget about my creator. And I remember asking this brother to give me literature of the religion of Islam, and he gave me the English translation of the Quran, and I rushed to my house and I started to read this book. Remind you, I come from the music industry. As they say that rappers are like poets. Rappers are like poets, they just doing poetry over music, over beats, huh? You heard it, you heard it the saying before. And as a rapper, for example, we pay attention to the words of other rappers. And to be honest, some of the most prolific, some of the most genius lyrics or words that you will ever hear is coming from the music industry. For example, Tupac Shakur, he was a genius when it comes to writing. I'm not talking about the musical side of it. I'm talking about as a poet. This individual was a genius to the point that in some of the universities in America, like Berkeley University in California, they have a class where they teach and they study the lyrics of Tupac Shakur in the University of Berkeley in San Francisco in Berkeley, California. So when I started to read the Quran, even though it was in an English translation, I knew instantly that these cannot be the words of a man. I said, there is no way on the face of the earth a man would come up with these words, would come up with these styles of words. This has to be from the one who created me. The more that I read this, the more that I read this book, the more that it made sense to me. The more that I knew the reason why I don't have my happiness, because I was living a life in contradictions of this book. I remember coming to a verse in the Quran when Allah says, truly, and the, truly in the remembrance of, of, in remembrance of Allah does the hearts find tranquility. Wallahi man, no matter how much money you have, no matter if you have billions, you will never find the tranquility you will find in worshiping your Lord. Simple. Allah says in the Quran, truly the hearts find tranquility in the remembrance of Allah. I remember coming to a verse in the Quran in the English translation. Allah says that every single soul shall taste death. At this particular time of my life, I lost many friends. I lost Tupac, Gaddafi, many friends I grew up with, they died. I used to go to certain individuals and ask them, why am I losing all my friends? They would give you all excuses. But no one told me what Allah says in the Quran. Listen, every single one of us have to die. Allah said, every single soul, we have to taste death. That means every single one of us in this room, 
we have a grave waiting for us. The scary part about it, we don't know when we're going to die. And that's being said, that means that as a Muslim, we should tread lightly while we're walking on this earth. Because imagine one day we wake up and walk out of our house, next thing you know we're lying on the table, somebody's undressing us. Somebody's pouring water and they're cleaning us and they're burying us in the grave the next few minutes later. This is the reality of a Muslim. The Muslim, we don't believe that we're going to live forever. We know that we're not going to live forever. We know from the hadith and we know from the ayats in the Quran that we're going to die. That being said, do we truly believe in this verse? Because if we truly believe in death, we will start walking our life and we will start changing our behavior. And we will remind ourselves before we commit a sin, we will say, wait a minute, I'm afraid to Allah will send an angel of death to snatch my soul while I'm in the corner drinking alcohol. We should have some type of shame or some a type of fear of our Lord that while we're on the corner smoking marijuana, that might be the time the angel of death snatch our soul. So when I read this verse, I knew it was the haq. Eventually, alhamdulillah, I accepted the religion of Islam and I was able to walk away from the music industry. One of the things I do now to travel the world as a motivational speaker, telling my story, telling my life, giving advice to myself first, and advice to some of the shabab. And my advice that I want to give to the Muslim youth and the youth in general today is to use your common sense. Why would you walk away from a lifestyle of Islam? A lifestyle of the life that the creator, listen, the creator of the heavens and the earth, he sent down a way of life for us. Who in their right mind would take that book and put it behind their back and say, now I want to live life as a rapper? Who in their right mind, what type of individual have any common sense would say, I don't want to live my life like a Muslim. In fact, I want to be like Tupac Shakur or the Outlaws, or I want to be like 50 Cent. Who in their right mind? I'm talking about you have Arabs. You have people that come from Muslim countries, from Somalia, from Arabia, from Palestine, from different Muslim countries, born with Nisan Arabi, the tongue of an Arab, born with the religion of Islam in a household. But how many of these same individuals is running away from Islam and running towards a life that people like myself in America is running away from? Does that make common sense? Do you think that's a wise transaction? That an individual was born upon the religion of Islam, but all of a sudden now he want to be a gangster? To the point, man, that you have Muslim gang members, Muslims killing each other. Wallahi, the brothers say, even here in Denmark, you have gangs made up of Muslim gangs going to another neighborhood, taking the life of another Muslim. Do you know how much of a grave sin that is? Can you imagine being raised on Yomu Kiyama telling Allah I killed this Muslim brother over cocaine? Can you think of this? Is, do this make sense? As one of the scholars, he said, to take the blood of a Muslim is worse than blowing up the Kaaba. Would you ever take yourself to Mecca and put a bomb on the Kaaba and blow up the Kaaba? You would never, you cannot phantom that idea. So why would you take the life of your Muslim brother? Blowing up the Kaaba is not worse than taking the life of your Muslim brother. But you have Muslims in this country every day killing each other in the name of what? And in the name of this dunya. In the name of a street that you don't even own. You can't even park your car on that street without getting a ticket. But you saying this is your neighborhood and you kill your Muslim brother. You kill your Muslim brother over this falsehood. Well, lie, this is a trap of the shaitan. You are friends of the shaitan. In fact, you helping, you aiding the shaitan. And you brothers think that these individuals are your brothers? Well, lie, these individuals are your enemies. On Yomu Kanyama, these people will be our enemies. How can an individual call you outside and say, smoke marijuana with me? Smoke, drink a little alcohol with me. Join this gang. Let's go kill another Muslim brother. Is this individual your friend? You got a nerve to say that this is your best friend. How can this individual be your best friend when he tell you to do the same things that the shaitan is telling you to do? How can this individual be your best friend? We have to wise up as the Prophet Sallallahu was telling him, he said a man is on a religion of his friends, so choose your companion wisely. We have to drop dead. Every single one of us, we're going to die. Or do we not believe in the Quran? Do we not believe in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi do we not believe when Allah said that the angel of death going to snatch our soul? So it's, use our common sense. Use our common sense, man. You're upon the religion of the prophets. You're upon the religion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon the ummah. Allah says in the Quran that you are the best generation that we raised up amongst mankind. Why? Because you're enjoying the good and you forbid the evil. But now you have Muslim sh shabab enjoying an evil, forbidding the good. And then you have the Muslims say, man, this is my brother. This is Muhammad. This is my best friend. He would die for me. He would take a bullet for me. A bullet for what? For crack cocaine? 
A bullet for what? Because you're in the same gang? A'udhu billah. How can we let the shaitan put us in this situation? Wallahi brothers, use your common sense. You're not a gangster because you're pulling a bullet on, on your no other Muslim brother. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said on Yom Kiyama, the first thing that we were called to account to after our Salat would be about who spilled blood unjustly. Allah says in the Quran in the English translation, whoever take a life unjustly is as if he killed the whole of humanity. Wallahi, are you not afraid of the words of your Lord? Are you not afraid of Allah? Are we to that point that we don't even care about the Quran anymore? We don't even care about the hadith. We're going to do what we want to do because what? We're gangsters. So when the angel of death comes snatch your soul, do you think you're a big enough gangster to chase the angel of death away? Every single one of us in this room going to drop dead. This is a reality that none of us going to get away from. In fact, every single one of us, if we realize that, we will be running back to Allah doing Toba. We will be begging Allah to forgive us our sins. It's a reality that we know we're going to die. Who in their right mind will not be trying to ask Allah to make us a better person? Because we all have shortcomings. No, don't get me wrong. None of us is perfect. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, every son of Adam is a sinner. But the best from amongst those that sin is the one that commit Toba, that does Toba. All of us have our shortcomings. All of us commit sins, but we should not be to the point that we commit sins every day like it's normal. We should not say halas. The Prophet wasallam said, I'm a sinner, pass the blunt. We should not live a life like that, man. We should be individuals when we commit sins and we fall weak and we have our shortcomings. We should rush and ask Allah to forgive us. Our sins should not be a habit. We should not feel comfortable. As one of the Salafis said, when the munafiq, and a, and a, 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 a grave sinner, a corrupt individual commit a sin, it is as, it as if it's a fly going past his nose, kidda, kidda. It does, it, it's nothing to him. He said, but when a believer commit a sin, it is as if a mountain is about to fall upon him. He cannot have any ease in his heart. He don't even feel comfortable because he just committed a sin against his Lord. As the Prophet Sallallahu was telling him, he said that if an individual commits a sin, he said Allah will put a black dot on his heart. He said, but if an individual commit toba, Allah will remove that black dot. Beware of sins, brothers. Beware of sins because how many people went to kufr because of sins? How many people committed kufr, disbelief in Islam because of sins? Because every time we commit a sin, there's a black dot on our heart. And eventually, the more we commit sins, next thing you know, we have a black heart. May Allah protect us from this. To the point that we won't even go and make salat anymore. It's normal for us. We don't even feel shame, we won't go pray no more. Our hearts are black. So going to the masjid mean nothing to us because our hearts are black. Making salat don't even mean anything for us. But once we was in the masjid in the front row, because of our sins, we can't even see the netma and the blessings of making salat. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, be aware. As one of the Salafi said, you should, not, you should not look at how small the great or the sin you committed. But in fact, you should look at how big the one you disobeyed. We don't say, oh, this is a small sin, man. Allah is gafur rahim Let me drink alcohol. Then I can do toba now. Then when I become 40, I go to hajj. Stuck for Allah. How do you know you're going to live to the next day? How many individuals go to sleep at night, wake up in the grave? How many people wake up out their door, next thing you know, they're on the table getting undressed? This is a reality, brothers and sisters. And being that this is a reality, wallahi, we should run back to Islam. What else is going to save us? What else is going to save us? How many of us commit sins for what? One minute of pleasure. One minute of pleasure, two minutes of pleasure, five minutes of pleasure, just to displease our Lord. So if an individual is using our common sense, because I want to I wanna just talk about common sense. Because all of us, alhamdulillah, we have common sense. What makes sense? Committing some type of pleasure that's going to last for five minutes, maybe even an hour. But maybe put ourselves in a situation that can land us in a hellfire for maybe 1,000 years. Does that make sense, brothers and sisters? Who would take a chance to say, you know what, I'm going to disobey my Lord for five minutes? Five minutes of pleasure, but maybe I'll go to the hellfire for a thousand years. Who would make that transaction? So it's very important, brothers and sisters, we return back to the religion of Islam. We return back to the religion of Islam because there's no success other than the religion of Islam. Nobody can give you success but religion of Islam. You will not be happy if you're not upon the religion of Islam. You will not have tranquility if you're not following the Quran and the Sunnah. Not only do we follow the religion of Islam, but we have to follow it correctly with the understanding of the Sahaba. We cannot remix Islam. We cannot say, man, in 2012, we're going to put a rap record spreading people and calling people to Islam. No, we follow Islam with the same understanding of the Sahaba. 
But my advice before we go to questions and answers, brothers, leave that gang life alone. Leave that gang life alone. Wallahi, it's a dangerous thing to be raised on Yomo Kiyama to face Allah killing your Muslim brother. This is not something light. This is not something little. This is not something you should be proud of that you can pick up a gun and murder your brother. Man, it's haram to take the life of even a non-Muslim. Even a non-Muslim. As the Prophet wasallam, it's even haram to take a life of an animal unjustly. So what about your Muslim brother? As there's a hadith of a woman who starved a cat. She starved her cat, locked the cat up and didn't feed the cat. The Prophet wasallam said while she was in her grave, Allah ordered the cat to scratch her in the face until Yom Kiyama. This is an animal. What about a human being? What about taking the life of a human being? So wise up. You're not gangsters. You are Muslims. Even Tupac, for example, who was a non-Muslim, he got into a fight with a director of a movie because they wanted to pay him $100,000 to play a Muslim gangster. This is an individual who's a non-Muslim. You know what he said? I would never play the part of a Muslim gangster because it doesn't exist. This is a non-Muslim said there is no such thing as a Muslim gangster. But now we are Muslim gangsters. Now you're telling each other, don't call me Muhammad, my name, kill him all. <laughs> now all of a sudden you want to be Jay-Z. Now all of a sudden it's embarrassing. The Muslims, we're embarrassed to be upon the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We're embarrassed. We're embarrassed to be a Muslim. May Allah make us better and guide us back to the religion of Islam with the understanding of the Sahabas. May Allah make us understand and realize that the angel of death want to snatch our soul and we have to be raised up and we have to live in a life, the next life forever, either Jahannam or Jannah. May Allah give us Jannah. But may Allah make us understand that this is a reality. May Allah make us understand that the reality is we're going to die. Are you not afraid to wonder what's going to happen to us when we're in that grave? Just contemplate what's going to happen to us. None of us know our situation. None of us even know if our deeds are being accepted. Even Umar Kitab, who the Prophet wasallam said he heard Umar footsteps in Jinnah before his. When Hudayfa came to Umar one time and told Umar not to pray over this individual because he's a munafi, he's a hypocrite. Umar, the leader of the believers, you know what he said to Hudayfa? He said, by Allah. I'm going to ask you this one time. Did the Prophet wasallam say that I'm amongst the hypocrites? SubhanAllah. This is Umar ibn Khattab. This is the one who the Prophet wasallam said, there is no prophet after me. But if there would have been a prophet, it would have been Umar. This is the individual who the Prophet wasallam said that Allah spoke the truth from the tongue of Umar. Verses of the Quran got revealed in favor of Umar. This was an individual who asked Hudayfa, am I one of the hypocrites? We do a good deed and we act like it's accepted. We feed somebody in Ramadan, mashallah, we on Twitter. Mashallah, I just fed five people in Ramadan. And we, 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 we update our status on Facebook. Alhamdulillah, I just gave $100. We act like our deeds are accepted. As Hassan al-Basri, he said, he said a believer are afraid, a believer is afraid of falling in hip hypocrisy, of falling to be a hypocrite. He said, but the hypocrite feel he will never be a hypocrite. SubhanAllah. This is how the earlier Muslims looked at Islam. This is how the earlier Muslims tread lightly. But we, who are we? Man, we, come, we run into do bad deeds and we running away from good deeds. So brothers and sisters, speaking to myself first because I know myself, I have probably more shortcomings than any of you in this room. So I'm not sitting here talking to you as if I'm better than you because I know my situation. So I ask Allah to make me a better Muslim first and to make us all better Muslims. But it's very important. One of the things of the advantage we have is to constantly ask Allah to forgive us. Because human beings, we commit sins not even knowing we commit sins. So even the Prophet Sallallahu was telling me, said, man, I ask Allah to forgive me more than 70 times a day. If this is our messenger, what about us? If the Prophet Sallallahu thought this way, if the Sahaba thought this way, what about us? So may Allah make us better Muslims. May Allah guide us to the religion of Islam with the correct understanding of the Sahaba. Very important. And may Allah make us better Muslims and may Allah make us die upon Quran and Sunnah and make us die upon Tawheed. And may Allah raise us on Yom Qiyamah with those that we love. And may Allah make us love the companions and Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Jazakallah khair brother, we can go into Q&A inshallah. Oh, one second, he break it down in Danish.
الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه وتابعيه بإحسان يوم الدين. الأستاذ إن شاء الله من تاكل فوكم هيدا. يقول تاكل هو مطاع فأجيوس. الفانتاسيس إكسبل هو مدن من فلاد دنيا فالله سكون. ما الله بلونه إن شاء الله فاسد الهنسي مان. Og gør os, at vi også får den her stærke iman, der gør, at vi foretrækker Allahs vej for Shaitans vej. Udskabet er klar og tydeligt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala har skabt os og vist os vejen til ham. Vejen til Jannah, inshallah. Og han viste os den vej, der fører os det modsatte vej, nemlig Shaitans vej. Og det er klart og tydeligt, profeten sallallahu alaihi sallam. Han har vist os vejen, han har forklaret os, hvad vi skal gøre, for at få Allahs velsignelse og Allahs tilfredsstilling. Vores mål i det her dunje liv, det er at være gode muslimer. Det, der kan forhindre os i at være gode muslimer, vores fjerne, kan man sige, det er først og fremmest shaitan. Og det andet er, det er vores nafs vores ego. Og det er de to ting, som vi skal sørge for, at vi har det, man kalder antivirus imod. Det er de virus, der vil prøve at påvirke os til at foretrække dunia i stedet for ærte op. Så hvis vi, stik, hvis vi sørger for, at vi har en stærk antivirus i vores hjerter, som kan, som kan bekæmpe de her virus, og det kan vi kun gøre ved at forstærke vores iman, ved at tilbyde Allah, ved at gøre de ting, som Allah er tilfreds med, ved at holde os væk fra haram og holde os til halal. Og det er på den måde, vi kan få en forbyggelse og en immunitet imod de her slags virus. Så min råd til jer, som en ældre bror, det er at sørge for, at I har Allah foran jer. Inden I begår nogle handlinger, så spørger jeg selv, er det noget, er det noget, de her tilfreds til Allah, eller er det noget, som bringer Allahs fred? Øh, det andet er, at hensyn til vores arbejde i Biomis, inshallah, vil vi gerne have, at I støtter op om vores arbejde via Miljatel, som frivillig i Biomis, også selvom I er her uden til, så vil vi have brug for folk også, som vi kan samarbejde med på tværs af hvad skal man sige, grænserne på tværs af byerne, for at fuldføre de, hvad skal man sige, de ønske, vi har i byvis. Vi mener, at vi har sovet lidt i timen. Altså, der mener jeg, den ældre generation. Vi har ikke været gode nok til at forsyne vores børn med det nødvendige hardware, software, som kan være med til at stærke, forstærke deres identitet, islamske identiteter. Vi har givet dem den forkerte hardware, det er, eller software, det er kærligheden til dunia. Og det er den forkerte software. Den rigtige software er kærligheden til Allah og hans profet, sallallahu alaihi wa sallam. Så vi prøver selvfølgelig at gøre, hvad vi kan for at rette op på de her fejltagelser. Vi er gør nogle ting, nogle initiativer, som retter sig mod vores børn. Helt ned til 5-6 års alder. Vi har lavet nogle tegnefilm, som bruger i Skander sag og den type, hvad skal man sige, produktioner. Og til det formål har vi brug for de øh, brødre og søstre, som har forstand på øh, det her type ting. Så I er velkommen til at melde jer til øh, via vores hjemmeside, den hedder virus.dk, øh, som frivillig. Øh, og så vil vi øh, inshallah kontakte jer øh, med det øh, for det formål. Det andet er, hvis I kan støtte op om vores projekter, fordi det her det er noget, der også koster penge ved jeres økonomiske støtte. I dag har vi tænkt os, inshallah, at der vil stå en søster eller en bror ved døren, så hvis I har noget, som I gerne vil donere, og det bliver inshallah som en sadaqajariya for jer, fordi det går til den islamske produktion, som skal henvende sig til den næste generation, inshallah. Måler på løn, inshallah, for at komme i dag. Måler på løn, både der fra MSU, for at en god engagement, en god engagement, mashallah, må Allah belønne brødrene fra det islamiske røde, og må Allah belønne først og fremmest bror Mubar for hans 
for hans fantastiske historier, som virkelig øh, har rødt mig i hvert fald, og rødt mange af dem, der har hørt det. Det er det, vi skal lære af. Det er det, vi skal tage ved lære af. Det er det, der er hos Allah, der er størst og mere værdifuld end det, der er i dunia. Jazakumullah. Jeg vil læse spørgsmålene op, som er kommet her. Prøv at gå altså igennem, inshallah, og prøv at drage det her i svaret på den løbe, inshallah. Vi kan lægge ud med den første, assalamu alaikum. I would like to know the thing that, that was most difficult for you, when you first entered Islam. Jazakallah. Bismillah. Salatu wassalamu alaikum 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 um, this was a, this was my business. This is all I knew since I was maybe 13, 12 years old. And I remember the first time I went to Hajj and I ran into some brothers from Pakistan, from Canada. And when they asked me what do I do for a living, I told them I'm in the music industry. And when these brothers said it's haram, well, I think mean, they was terrorists. You know, they said music is haram. And I said, man, these guys have to be terrorists. As a matter of fact, I'm running away from them. To the point that if I see them in the lobby, I see them here, I go that way because I ain't want nothing to do with these individuals. When I first accepted the religion of Islam, I couldn't understand why a person would tell me that music was haram, you know? And it wasn't until later on when I started to read it, some brothers, alhamdulillah, they gave us a proof from Quran and Sunnah. You have proof from the Quran and the Sunnah about the impermissibility of musical instruments uh, from the four men had, from Maliki, Hanbali, Shafi, Hanafi, they had it all. And when I see that, alhamdulillah, I had to ask myself, did I come to, to the religion of Islam wholeheartedly, or do I want to play around? So alhamdulillah, I have to make a lot to Allah to guide me away from the music and the music industry, alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum. Do you have some good advice to give Muslims, girls, who try to live and educate themselves in a Western world, but me obstacles, just uh, My advice, of course, for the Muslim men and women, there's nothing wrong with them in secular education. Of course, the most important education we should provide ourselves with is the education of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This should be the utmost important for us to know our Lord and our religion. But there's nothing wrong with the Muslims educating themselves, you know, alhamdulillah, especially for the men and the women. We have to provide for our families. Uh, we want to be able to lead the world once again, inshallah. But the most important thing is the Islamic education and also secular education, inshallah. So um, as long as it's not a situation that put us in um, contradiction of our religion, alhamdulillah, may Allah give, you, give us to keep educating ourselves and our children, inshallah. Excuse me. Nah. Can I ask you something, sir? Nah. The first uh, question uh, about the music. How did you leave the, the music that you love so much that you work for? So you work for? How did you leave it? Or, you know, how did you just give it up? Alhamdulillah, making dua to Allah. You know, I remember it was very hard for me at the beginning, but I constantly asked Allah to guide me away from it and remove the love that I had for it out of my heart. Alhamdulillah, man, Allah answered my dua, alhamdulillah. So, it's something that sometimes the Muslims, we try everything except for dua. The first thing we should do is dua, you know? What is the difference between nation of Islam and regular Islam? Wa alaykum salam. The nation of Islam, for example, they are a sect, a cult in America, which they try to take the Quran, similar to what the people did with Christianity in America, the Europeans that came to America with Christianity, where they put this God in the form of a white God, and they said, this is the one you should worship Jesus, alayhi salam, for example. What the nation of Islam did, they tried to use the Quran and do something similar. They said, for example, that Allah is a black man, how would we not? And they said that everybody with white skin, blonde hair, blue eyes, 
which means you Dutch people will be in trouble. You know, they said that these people are devils out in Milan. And they also said that there's another prophet who came after the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His name was Elijah Muhammad. And as a Muslim, we know that the religion of Islam is not a religion based on race. You know, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that an Arab is not better than a non-Arab and vice versa. And he said that a black is not better than a white and vice versa. He said, what makes you good in the eyes of Allah is your taqwa, your piety, your fear of your Lord. So it doesn't matter your race or your tribe, this has nothing to do with the religion of Islam. And also as a Muslim, we know that there's nothing on the heavens and the earth that we can compare with Allah. We cannot liken Allah to His creation. We know that this is kufr to liken Allah to His creation. We know that Allah is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He's not a man, he's not a woman, he's not black, he's not white. We don't liken Allah to His creation. So the nation of Islam, they said that Allah is a man. And it's a, it's a hatred, a, a, religion, a hatred sect. You know, their whole thing is based on kufr and hatred, racism. They no different than the KKK. You know the KKK? In fact, wallahi, this is how you know they were jammed up. A long time ago when Muhammad Ali was part of the KKK, this is a true story, the KKK had a rally with the Nation of Islam. These are people that hate black people, and the Nation of Islam hate white people, but they came together on the stage and they held hands. So this is to let you know that they both belief system is an evil belief system and has nothing to do with the religion of Islam. You know? Besides telling about your life story, what other uh, initiatives uh, or projects are you involved in? Um, now I live in Saudi Arabia. We are Saudi Arabia. Um, I work with Maktaba Dawa, which is a Dawa center. Um, I, I do Dawa the English language to the non-Muslims in Saudi Arabia. But at the same time, alhamdulillah, I have businesses, I have a clothing company, um, which alhamdulillah, we run some t-shirts, which is, you can also check out the website the brother put on the board. So alhamdulillah, besides my businesses, spending time with my family, and, and studying the Arabic language, and trying to study my religion, I try to do down to the best of my ability. There are quite, uh, quite a few questions about uh, about music in general. Um, they go, they go. Yeah, basically. Uh, can you explain? Can you please explain the danger of hearing music? And uh, do you miss the music? And, and what what do you think of of, uh, of Muslim rappers, for example, Ice Cube, most of them? Are they even considered Muslims? Um, I answer the second question. Um, from what we know, um, I used to be mentioned that he's Muslim, and also most deaf is a Muslim. As we know that the music industry doesn't make a person a non-Muslim. Even if a Muslim drinking alcohol, committing zina, we know that these things don't take them outside the fold of Islam. They would just be considered sinners. So we don't say just because he's in the music industry he's a non-Muslim. We don't do that. Alhamdulillah, we have a belief that a Muslim is a Muslim. Um, may Allah guide him away from that lifestyle. Um, alhamdulillah, there's nothing from the music industry that I miss. I'm not guiding me away from that. Um, I don't believe that there's a such thing as Muslim rappers. I don't believe that there's a way that you can spread Islam with music. If there was, I believe that Allah would legislate this in the Quran and the Sufi. As Allah knew that there would be a time when people love music. Um, even in the time of Arabia, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in his time, there were many Arab tribes um, that used to listen to music. We never heard the Prophet of Islam say, Yo Abu Bakr, go get the drum and flute, go to this tribe and sing to Islam. You know, we follow Islam as Allah says in the Quran, O Muhammad, you tell the people that this is my straight path, and they follow and they call to Allah and with that straight path. We don't try to innovate. Because, like Imam Malik, Rahimullah, he said, whenever you innovate something in the religion of Islam, for example, let's say we try to say, I'm going to spread Islam with music. Imam Malik said, whenever you innovate something in Islam, in other words, you're saying to Allah that you made a mistake sending the Prophet Muhammad. He didn't do a good job, so I'm going to come up with a new technique to call people to Islam because the Prophet didn't do a good enough job. So this is why it's important that we don't innovate in the religion. Allah says in the Quran that today I favored you and chose Islam as your favor. I perfected my favor upon you and chose Islam as your religion. The religion of Islam is perfect. We cannot take from it. We cannot change it. We leave it alone. And Allah knows best, Alhamdulillah. A lot of Muslim sisters have a hard time wearing the hijab in this society. What advice, advice would you give them? My advice, Alhamdulillah, would be from Quran and Sunnah. No matter what society you live in, 
Allah made it man mandatory, he legislated that the woman and the Muslim men would have to dress a certain way. In the religion of Islam, it teaches us that we have to dress a certain way. There's no way, for example, that you can go against the obedience of Allah if he made it wajib upon us. So for the Muslim sisters, alhamdulillah, may Allah give them patience and make them love the hijab. Alhamdulillah, living in a country like Denmark, you see many sisters who wear hijab, they have no problem practicing the religion of Islam in many Western countries, you have no problem. So there's no excuse for a person to say, I'm living in Denmark, I cannot wear my hijab. As you see that the mini sister does it, you know, the government is not forcing them to take it off, etc. So if there's no excuse to say that you cannot wear your hijab, this is something that Allah legislated. And even for men, you know, nowadays you have a lot of Muslim shabab, they wear skinny jeans, tight pants, tight clothes. Even us, we have to dress a certain way as well, you know what I mean? And we have to carry ourselves and, and conduct ourselves as Muslims, alhamdulillah. So may Allah, like I mentioned, man, in the Western countries, even in America, you have some rights, the Muslim have many rights, and unfortunately, some Muslim countries. So alhamdulillah, you have no problem practicing your religion in Denmark. Some questions about uh, how, how people react when you convert to Islam. Uh, your grandparents, your friends, uh, and do you wish to go by your Muslim name or your artist name? Alhamdulillah, my family, my family was very supportive when I accepted Islam. Uh, the majority of my family are Christians, they never went against me. Alhamdulillah, they you know, very supportive. If I go to their house, for example, they make sure they don't cook pork, you know what I mean? They don't drink around me. They're very, very respectful, very supportive. And Alhamdulillah, my parents named me Top, so I'd rather go by my Muslim name rather right, than the Polish name. So the Muslims in America, they had no, no, mashallah, even my masjid in Los Angeles, we call the Adan five times a day outside, nobody bother us, we have freedom to practice the religion of Islam, alhamdulillah. There's no, no one stopping us in America, they give us our rights as a Muslim, alhamdulillah. Even in the White House and the Pentagon, we have masjids, alhamdulillah, because of the Muslims that work there. So Islam is wrong, alhamdulillah. about the music again. Uh, how do you feel about young people who follow your music to the point that they almost live it? And do you feel some kind of guilt for what you have brought to the world of music? And how do you handle the guilt you have to deal with? Well, first of all, the way I feel, I'm not here telling the people to listen to my music. Um, I did tour from the music industry. I clarified myself, I made it clear 
that I'm not involved in the music industry, and I, I don't advise you guys to listen to my music, because the music that I love, of course, I was jahil, I was ignorant, and it was before the religion of Islam, so the stuff that I put out before the call to contradiction of Islam. If it was up to me, I'd be able to take them off the shelves or off the radio, but I have no control over that. So, alhamdulillah, Allah, may Allah accept my tawbah, I wasn't a Muslim, and for me, that's my past. I would tell the Muslim youth that you in control of your own destiny. You have to basically make your own choice. You know what I mean? I want to tell you to listen to the music. You have a choice to make a right or wrong choice, and I would tell you listening to this type of music, or any music is a bad choice. I would tell you, why would you listen to some? Every other word is a cuss word. First of all, every other word is probably kufun. And how many of the rappers and Muslims riding in the cars repeating the words of these rappers? And remember, we have angels that's recording everything we say. It's not like the angels say, halas, they put the rap record in, turn off the record. No, they record even when you say these kufun words of these rappers. So how about we feel on Yom Kiyama when we get our words played back to us, it's going to be the words of these rappers. And many of them call in contradiction of Islam. So it's not even good to waste your time listening to this stuff. Music destroys the heart. It's not going to be no good for them. Most of the people that actually accept the Islam, the music, they don't even want to listen to Quran. They only want to listen to music. As Ibn Qayyim al Josiah, he said that you will not find one color, one heart that has a love of music and a love of Quran in the same heart. Either an individual will love music, he will leave Quran, or a person will love Quran, and he will not listen to music. And this is the condition of the Muslims. You see them in love with music. They never listen to the Quran, which is the speech of Allah. So it's very important to leave that self alone. Nothing good gonna come out of you, come from you listening to music. Nothing. You're not gonna get no money from it. You're not gonna get no good deeds. You're not gonna grow, you're not gonna get no muscles. Nothing good gonna come out of you from you listening to music. It's only a waste of time. So inshallah, may Allah make us leave that lifestyle. If you could give an advice to how to fill your heart with demand faith again, please. Well, as this advice is for myself first. As the Prophet of the Light of the he said, Iman goes up and down. He said, Iman increases with good deeds and obedience to Allah, and it decreases with bad deeds and obedience to the shaitan. So as a Muslim, this is proof that every single one of us, our Iman goes up and down. If you're a Muslim, this is what we believe in because we believe what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. So when we feel like we have no Iman, and I'm speaking to myself first, then maybe we should do more Tawbah, we should ask Allah to forgive us, and we should start doing good deeds. The more good deeds we do, the more our Iman increases. As one time, the Sahaba, one of the Sahaba, they came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they said, when we are amongst you, and you talk about Jahannam and Jannah, they said, it's as if we see it with our own eyes. He said, but when we leave you, and we go back to our families, we don't feel that man, we don't feel that feeling in our hearts anymore. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that if you were able to keep the Iman at the same level as when you with me, he said the angels will come down and shake your hand. Because this is impossible that an individual will keep Iman, it goes up and down. So as, as something that I like to do to myself, whenever I don't feel good, or whenever things aren't going my way, I always blame it on me committing too many sins. If something happened bad to me, I say it's because of my sins. As Allah says in the Quran, whatever evil befalls you is from what your own hands put forth. So inshallah, we try to better ourselves on a daily basis and we try to continue to do good deeds. And when we slip and have our shortcomings, we should always ask Allah to forgive us constantly, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Have you ever been in a situation where you could kill another person but chose to walk away? <laughs> you must be the police in here, huh? <laughs> I will share one story, um, and the reason why I'm sharing it is because I have a book coming out and I actually put this in my book, um, that I believe that it was a, a situation for me to take revenge, but all praise to Allah, Allah was able to, to refrain me from, you know, spilling the blood of an innocent person. A few years ago, um, my brother one day called me, I came to his house, and he gave me a call, told me to come to his house, and he told me that a friend of ours is in the same cell, a prisoner, with the individual who killed my mother and father. My brother at this particular time, he wasn't a Muslim. So my brother was excited and he said, Alhamdulillah, not Alhamdulillah, he said, thank God, we finally gonna get our revenge. He said, I told our friend to make sure you take care of this individual. So my friend who was in the cell with this individual, he was doing something that in America we call rocking him to sleep. Befriending him, pretend that he's his friend 
so that he can get comfortable with this individual. And then Allah so he can stab him up and do whatever he had to do. This individual murdered my mother and father, he became Muslim. And I know the rights of a Muslim above another Muslim, so I told my brother this, you shouldn't do this because he's a Muslim. Me and my brother get into a big argument. He wasn't, he wasn't a Muslim at this time. Alhamdulillah, he's a Muslim now. We got into a big argument, and my brother said, no, he's going to feel some type of, at least he's going to get a beat down. This is what my brother's at work with us. And Alhamdulillah, I remember prior to that, there was an individual. He's a Dai in America named Daoud Adi. He's very famous, Dai, mashallah, that goes around and talks and graduated and studied in Medina. A couple of weeks before this happened, Daoud Adi told me that there's a Muslim brother who works at the prison with the same person who killed my mother and father. So when I was able to leave, I called Dawood Adi and I said, this is what's happening. My mother and a friend of mine's, a friend of mine's is in the cell with the individual that killed my mother and father, and he's gonna do something to me. I said, so I advise you to call the Muslim brother to remove this individual out of the cell. And I said, but well, before you do that, please make it clear that it's the same individual whose mother and father he murdered, that I'm the one that's saving his life by the permission of Allah only because he's my Muslim brother. And I don't want to have no blood, no, no the hands of a, I don't want to be raised with no kid with the blood of a Muslim or an innocent person on my hands. So I said, make sure you relay this message to him. Alhamdulillah, they was able to move the individual out of the cell instantly, and no harm came his way, Alhamdulillah. So that was probably one test that I was struggling with. It, it, it was a real big struggle for me at that moment to know that I had the, the mercy of an individual in my hands about the same individual that murdered my mother and father. And always due to Allah that Allah allow me not to make an evil, an evil choice on me. What did you feel when you converted? And how did you manage to survive when you were in the game? If you were. First of all, I was never in the game, Alhamdulillah. Um, when I converted to Islam, it was the best feeling, you know? As you hear many of the converts, they say when they feel, when they take their shahada, it's as if a burden was released off their back. I felt the same way, mashallah. You know, words can't explain when I accepted the religion of Islam, but even if there's any novices in here, um, I think that you should learn about the religion of Islam, study Islam, accept the religion of Islam. Um, don't judge the religion of Islam from us, the Muslims, because we, we have many mistakes and have shortcomings, but the religion of Islam is a perfect way of life. It only calls to the worship of the one who created you, who created us. It doesn't call to the worship of no human being. Alhamdulillah, the Prophet said the line of the sun, he said that you die on the covenant to Tawheed, believing in Allah alone, worshiping Allah alone, that in the next life you have a jinn, a paradise forever. So inshallah, as any novice in the hand, I'm sure that some of the brothers can, and sisters can give you some literature on the religion of Islam, inshallah. Has any of your friends converted to Islam after you? Alhamdulillah, many of my friends accepted Islam. Um, I believe I mentioned yesterday the Alamos, for example, all the members of the Alamos became Muslim. Um, some friends that I grew up with in my neighborhood, um, my brothers accepted Islam. Islam through textual evidences. 
And we don't have nothing in Islam that gives us permission to do music. And even as you mentioned that you can have any job in the world, that's not true. And for example, you cannot be a bartender as a Muslim. You cannot go work at a bar and sell alcohol. The religion in Islam that legislates and it tells us what to do and what we don't do. It tells us how to dress and how we should dress. It tells us what to eat, what to drink, and what not to eat and what not to drink. The religion of Islam, we have borders. And we shouldn't transgress these boundaries of Allah. So being in the music industry is not something that we say don't do because we just say not to do. As I mentioned, you have proof from Quran and Sunnah. You have proof from all four men have, all four men have that said musical mission is not permissible. The only thing was permissible in the time of the Prophet was the duff. And I even take me and I like said, if the Sahaba said, if they saw a man playing the duff, they would say that man is a feminine individual. So we don't sit here and say, man, it's 2012, let us introduce something in our religion. No, we should stop with the Sahaba stop that. We should stop with the Sahaba stop that. Because as one of the scholars said, if there was anything good, Allah would have allowed the Sahabas to beat us to that. So if we all of a sudden come in 2012 and we have something better to spread Islam, Allah didn't give it to the Sahabas. Anything that was good, Allah honored the Sahabas to do it first. So we should stop with the Sahaba, stop that, and we should feel uncomfortable trying to introduce anything in the religion of Islam. And being a so-called Muslim rapper, or so-called Islamic music, is something that been introduced in Islam. Because as we mentioned yesterday, anything that you attribute to the religion of Islam, it has to be pure from Allah. Allah, for example, you cannot say this music is pure because you have gangster music, you have devil worship music. So that's like saying Islamic alcohol, Islamic marijuana, you cannot put these words together. So may Allah make us all better, and may Allah give us a correct understanding of our religion according to the Quran and the Sunnah with the understanding of the Sahaba, because this is Islam. Like Ibn Malik said, he said, what was Islam in the past would be Islam to no Qiyam, and we should be comfortable practicing it how the Sahaba is practicing it, inshallah. All right, Jazakallah, okay, brothers and sisters, I appreciate your time. And um, the brother just reminded me, my manager, inshallah. <laughs> um, yeah. I have some shirts, I have a word on uh, wisdom.com, and this is one of our things, one of our designs, money to your money. We have shirts in Arabic, calligraphy, shirts with English word, words. We have those, and inshallah, in the future, we'll be able to introduce a lot for the women and for the sisters. So if you're able, inshallah, there's 200 crickets, I'm going to 200 crickets. Cones. Cones? 200 cones. Cones? 200 cones. Inshallah, Jazakallah, Kiribati, this is it.